say good morning, everyone, and thank you, Alicia. Um, welcome to panel one. Today, we're going to be discussing social security benefits and demographic trends. I'm your moderator, Karen Glenn. I'm the deputy chief actuary at the Social Security Administration. So we've got three very interesting papers this morning um, from Samir Kosick, Mary Hammond, and Damon Jones. And please remember, as Alicia just mentioned, if you have a question for any one of the panelists, please submit it via the Ask a Question button at any time during the panel. And really, the sooner the better. Um, so before we ask the panelists to present their papers, I want to put these topics in a little bit of context. I've just got a few slides of my own on what we're seeing in the data. Um, Obviously, there are many, many important demographic and economic factors that are critical to evaluating the Social Security and SFI program. So we're just going to focus on a few of those today. So um, let me get to the slide. Great. All right. First thing I want to look at a little bit was employment and labor force participation. So obviously, employment has a direct effect on the amount of payroll tax revenue coming into the Social Security program. And a very closely related measure is labor force participation. So in this slide here, um, not sure if you can all see it very well, but on the left, we've got male ratios of employment and population by age group through time. So you'll see some interesting patterns here for the men. Um, since about 1980, things were relatively flat for 25 to 54 and 55 to 59. They were increasing somewhat for the older age group. Then the recession, hit. you'll see that vertical line in the middle. Um, for the younger age group, things went way down. Since then, employment has really recovered nicely for all age groups. And in particular, in the most recent years, you'll see pretty significant gains. Um, patterns for women are similar. Um, you'll see the levels are a bit lower, as traditionally women have not been the primary owner. Obviously, that is changing through time. Um, but very similar patterns. One thing to notice is that male were certainly hurt a little more by the most recent recession. All right, next slide. All right, one other thing we'll be focusing on today is longevity. And in particular, I wanted to point out a study we did at the Social Security Administration a couple of years ago. This was work by me, Tiffany Bosley, and Michael Morris in 2018, and I've got a link there for you. Our focus was on mortality by career average earnings level. And what we did was to look at Social Security retired worker beneficiaries in various age groups through time and to see what the various death rates were at different earnings levels. Um, we found a clear spread in mortality depending on earnings level. No real surprise. Many other researchers have found this as well. Um, the graphs I'm showing here are for ages 65 to 69 through time. You can see that the spread is quite big for men, not as significant for women. Um, our theory there is, again, the women are having traditionally, at least in these age groups, been the primary earner. So their earnings might not be as indicative of their overall socioeconomic status. Um, so what we will hear today from Mary is more about the SFI population, which may be similar to the lower income levels in the social security program. And she's really looking at the relationship between nursing the home use and increasing longevity and diversity. And one thing I should have mentioned on the previous slide is we will be hearing from Demir first, and he is looking at the relationship between labor force participation and life expectancy. 
All right, let's move on to the next slide. Great. Um, one other thing I wanted to show was some recent trends in retirement benefits and interest. And this is sort of tangentially related to what we'll hear a little later from Damon. Um, interesting patterns through time. And these graphs may be a little tricky to understand at first glance, but what they are trying to do is show the percentage of people at these various ages who are already in benefit claiming status. So for example, the blue lines at the bottom are folks who are have already claimed their benefits by the time they're 62 and a half. So what you can see there is that uh, for men, back in 1975, about 30% had claimed their benefits by age 62 or a little bit thereafter. That went up over time. The more people were claiming early. But since about 1995, that's declined significantly. Um, now we are below 20% of workers actually claiming their benefits at age 62. Many more are claiming their older age. You can also see in this graph around 2000, the effect of eliminating the earnings tax, which Damon will discuss a little bit more in his paper, obviously has a huge effect on the claiming pattern. And similarly for women, um, women have traditionally, you can see from like 1975 to 2000, tended to claim their benefits earlier. Many more of them claiming at age 62. But that has really changed recently too. People are delaying claiming. All right, let's move on to the next slide. So I think as Kate mentioned earlier, the big elephant in the room, COVID effect. What is this COVID-induced recession going to do to all of these factors? Obviously, many of these papers were written before COVID. Our most recent trustees report was done before COVID, but it is something we're all grappling with now. So we all know employment and labor force participation rates have declined with the recession. Will they stay low or will they rebound soon? Will COVID death continue to be concentrated at older ages and among people of color primarily? Um, will we see persistent and maybe even cumulative effects on mortality and morbidity in the longer term. Um, obviously, there are direct virus-related deaths. Um, we've seen indications of increased death to despair. Maybe we'll hear a little bit more about this from Ann Hughes this afternoon. Um, violence, suicide, homicide, unfortunately. Um, and will we see lower life expectancy in the future from compromise? for the COVID survivors, will that be a significant effect as we go forward? Not really clear at this point. So much of what we're seeing depends on government responses, individual responses, and obviously the timing and efficacy of the vaccine. Next slide. So one other thing I wanted to mention, there's been a lot of speculation in the press. Uh, that the recession will cause workers to apply for retirement benefits earlier than they would have otherwise. Um, we are seeing this in the data yet. We're obviously keeping a very close eye on it. Um, similarly, we aren't yet seeing evidence of increased EI or SSI applications. Um, speculation at the moment is that people are really relying on extended unemployment benefits. You know, some of those were cut back at the end of July. Um, but folks might start applying for later if the recession is The graph here is showing um, application for disabled worker benefits through June 2020. So you can see um, no real evidence of an increase in application, maybe even a little dip at the end. All right, so that is it for my slides. As I mentioned, we've got a great panel coming up. Um, I think I will turn it over to Samir. Okay. Uh, thank you, Karen. Um, so, uh, it is my pleasure to present um, our work uh, on uh, longevity and um, work at older ages. 
This is a collaboration with my colleagues from Urban Institute, uh, Jean Sterley and Aaron Williams. On their and my behalf, I would like to thank these participants and um, our partners at the uh, uh, Center for Retirement Research at Boston College and Social Security Administration. Um, also, big thanks to uh, 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 Karen and her team at SSA for their valuable uh, feedback. So um, we uh, know intuitively and based on theoretical models that people should remain in labor force longer if they expect to live longer. But um, can we um, uh, quantify that empirically? Um, it is surprisingly difficult. Um, Khan, Rutledge and Wu showed that individuals perception of, of longevity affects their retirement planning and retirement behavior. But we would like to understand this at the population level. Um, another reason to, um, to study this topic is to inform projections of future economic outcomes. Uh, Social Security Board of Trustees in their annual report um, project uh, future labor force participation and they adjust it for uh, future increases in longevity. Um, but there is very little research on this topic. Next slide, please. Um, there are two main mechanisms through which um, uh, longevity affects work at older ages. One is health. Uh, life expectancy is a measure of population's health. And by that virtue, it's also a measure of its capacity for work. So this is a direct link. Um, the other mechanism is related to retirement planning. People work during most of their lives and they save for retirement. And when their expected length of that retirement increases because of increases in life expectancy, their optimal response is to increase their saving rate and to postpone retirement. So both of these mechanisms create a positive correlation between these two outcomes. Next slide, please. Um, but this is not what we see in historical data. This chart shows uh, labor force participation in blue and uh, life expectancy in yellow. And as you can see, life expectancy has been slowly increasing uh, over this period of 170 years. Um, uh, but labor force participation was decreasing for most of this period, um, mostly due, due to other factors like uh, um, urbanization, industrialization, emergence of uh, pensions and social security. But it is extremely difficult to isolate the effects of these other factors from the effects of longevity. So this is why we adopted a spatial rather than temporal approach in this study. Uh, next slide, please. The data that allowed us to, uh, to, to conduct this uh, uh, spatial analysis is a US Small Area Life Expectancy Estimates Project by the National Center for Health Statistics. This data set provides estimates of life expectancy by uh, gender and age groups um, at the census track level. The other data set we used is a five-year American Community Survey, which provides uh, labor force participation rate um, and various socioeconomic outcomes all at the track level. Uh, next slide, please. So this data shows positive correlation between these two variables. So life expectancy here is on the horizontal axis and labor force participation on vertical. Um, each dot represents uh, census tracts. Uh, and these, these charts are for women ages 55 to 64 on the left and 65 to 74 on the right. Um, the yellow line is, is a trend um, uh, estimated by uh, cubic regression slide, splines. Um, and you can see that, that labor force participation increases with uh, life expectancy and then plateaus at some point. Next slide, please. Um, the situation is similar for men. Magnitudes are, are, are a little different, but um, the, the, the pattern uh, looks the same. Next slide, please. The, um, to give you a little more uh, feel for geography, uh, these maps show life expectancy on the left and labor force participation on the right. Um, and they're color coded to in, in the shades of blue. Uh, these maps are for men ages 65 to 74. You can see 
others in, in our paper. Um, so you can see that there's, there's some uh, spatial correlation here, but not, um, it, it's far from perfect. Um, but um, this, this is, and also this is on um, uh, the unit of observation here is uh, commuting zone rather than census tract, which is, which is too small for this. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, we quantified this effect by using multivariate regression with uh, log, log labor force participation rate as dependent variable and uh, average life expectancy as the main explanatory variable. Um, unit of observation is census tract. Uh, we estimated models for four age gender groups, and we also included fixed state and commuting zone effects uh, to eliminate variation that might be due to uh, state specific um, uh, laws or, or uh, maybe um, local economic conditions and so on. Uh, next slide, please. And um, so our um, results, so the estimated effects are relatively modest. This, um, they are also nonlinear in uh, um, uh, life expectancy. So this chart is showing the percentage change in labor force participation rate uh, due to one year increase in life expectancy. Um, men are here in blue and women in yellow. Um, and you can see that that effect is, is significantly bigger for men. Um, it starts around 0.8 um, at age 55 and increases to around 2.4% um, at age 74. This discontinuity at age 64 is because of this transition between the two age groups. For women, um, uh, the, the uh, range is between zero and 0 0.7 for ages 55 to 64. And then for at older ages, the, the um, effect doesn't vary with age, but uh, surprisingly, it, it, the, the actually we, we allowed it to vary by uh, median household income in census tract. And we obtained negative res, uh, effect for bottom two quartiles. And uh, this is valued, the value shown here is for, uh, for, the, uh, for third quartile and uh, it's around point three. Um, next slide, please. Uh, to, to give you an idea how this compares to the trustees um, uh, projections and basically the, the, so we, we estimated the implied effect uh, in these projections and this is shown on the right. On the left is the chart from the previous slides just scaled and you can see that for men um, these effects are actually uh, very similar. They diverge a little bit at older ages but they're, they're in the same range. For women, it's is is where the, the difference is bigger. Uh, our uh, estimates are, are significantly smaller. Next slide, please. To conclude, so we used uh, spatial analysis to understand the relationship between longevity and work at older ages, um, and we found a relatively modest effect of longevity, um, and um, with a couple of caveats that. Uh, so one is that we're not certain that we captured the full effect um, in order for the retirement planning effect to mechanism to, to actually work, people need to be aware of the, of this, of the variation in longevity. There is some evidence that they are aware of this variation over cohort, but, but uh, there's no evidence that they are aware of, like, of the spatial variation. Um, and so that, that might be the uh, one direction for, for future research. Another thing that we would like to look at closer is this negative effect for women ages 65 to 74 in low income areas. Um, next slide, please. So I want to thank you and we welcome all uh, any comments and uh, questions. And uh, now we will hear from uh, Mary Hammond. Thank you. Demir, thank you so much. I enjoyed your presentation. Uh, the work that I'm presenting today, slide please. Uh, great, thank you. 
Demir, um, let's go ahead and get started with my presentation. The work that I'm presenting is demographics of aging in place. And my goal is to provide some implications for the Supplemental Security Income Program. I'm specifically focused on those who are in the aged population. So that would be defined as age 65 and above. And I wanna begin by motivating this project with the following puzzle. Already in the 1990s, it was evident that despite the fact our population is getting older, there are more people over age 65, there are actually fewer living in nursing homes, which is not necessarily what we would have expected. Slide, please. So in this project, I seek to answer four questions that are related to this puzzle. And the first question focuses on whether or not living arrangements, nursing homes included, really differ over time for very low income older adults, those likely to be eligible for supplemental security income relative to the rest of the older adult population. And next, if we do see differential trends in nursing homes, where are people living instead? What living arrangements are actually rising in prevalence? Third, I want to try and understand how much of the decline in nursing home residents is actually due to demographic trends or those trends in longevity that Karen mentioned in her opening remarks. And I'll motivate in just a moment why I'm thinking about looking there. Finally, again, as I mentioned, my goal is to discuss implications for the SSI program. And one of the reasons that living arrangements matter so much for this program is that the amount of payment that a person is entitled to depends in part on where they live. And so that's the key link between policy decisions and the work that I'll be presenting today. Slide, please. So before I dive into the results, let's just motivate why a more diverse population may potentially use less nursing home care. And I'm going to begin by showing you what the trends look like or the relationships between race and nursing home residents were back in the 1980s. Slide, please. So if we just simply look at what the age specific rate of living in a nursing home residence is, we can see some striking differences. In these graphs on the y-axis, what I have is the share of persons at each age shown on the x-axis who live in a nursing home setting. So if we look at the rates for white persons beyond age 80 up until age 90, they really climb from about 10% up to over 20%. And we can see that although some of the estimates are a bit noisier for say American Indians or Alaskan natives, there are striking differences between the white population, the black population, and our Asian or Pacific Islander populations. Now, if these groups continue to behave in the same ways over time, but we simply have a more diverse population, this demographic transition in and of itself could lead to a decline in nursing home residents. Slide please. I also looked at ethnicity and again, showing you just what things look like in the 1980s, we see a similar line of logic. The non-Hispanic population, especially at the oldest ages, had much higher rates of nursing home residency than any of our Hispanic populations as of the 1980s. Slide please. The same logic exists for why changes in the gender composition of the older adult population might lead to declines in nursing home residents. As men began to live longer, we uh, may potentially see a decline. Slide, please. And that's because in 1980, the share of people living in nursing home residents was actually lower among men than it was among women. That may seem somewhat counterintuitive because we generally think that men uh, have, may have more poor health conditions in older age, but this effect may operate through marital status. If men are living uh, shorter lives than women, then their spouses may survive them and serve as informal caregivers in those later phases of life. Slide, please. So the data that I use to study this population come from the decennial census, 1980, 90, and 2000. And in the more recent years, I'm using the American Community Survey. It's really important to use these very large data sets because the populations that I'm studying are very small. So they're extremely important from a policy perspective, but somewhat difficult to study in surveys that have some of our richer measures like the health and retirement study. Additionally, these particular surveys are really the only ones that include both the institutional resident population, which would be our nursing home residents, and those who live in the community. So I'm able to measure both populations with the same set of survey instruments. Slide, please. So what do I find? 
Well, for the first question, do trends in living arrangements differ for very low income older adults? What I'm showing you here are just basic bivariate statistics, but when we regression adjust these, the punchline is pretty much the same. So in the two graphs in the right hand side, there I'm showing you the income eligible population for SSI. So this would be our very low income group. Left hand side are other 65 and older individuals. The red series is the most recent rate of nursing home residents for 2014, 2014 to 2018. And we can see that that's well below the 1980 series for our low income group. And in fact, all of the effects seems to be operating in this lowest income population segment. Slide please. So which rates of residents are rising? Where are people living instead? Well, in my paper, I look at 12 other living arrangements and I'm just going to show you results for the two where the changes are the most striking. And in these graphs, again, for higher income and lower income populations, we see big differences. The living arrangement that I'm showing you is the rate of residents with younger relatives. So for example, your adult children or even your grandchildren, and it's living in their homes. And whose home you're living in does matter for SSI payment levels. We can see that for our low income population, these rates have increased at just about every age, except for the very oldest. And we see a markedly different pattern for individuals who are higher income. It's actually a slight decline in the rate of co-residents, especially at those latest stages. Slide please. Now all along you may be thinking, what about assisted living? When I say nursing home, does that include assisted living? I tried very hard to use some of the measures in the census to distinguish people who are in those assisted living settings, which are generally considered community-based when it comes to policies and programs, including Medicaid. Here I'm showing you a bit more detail on the slide about what was happening in the intervening years between my squares, which are 1980, and then the filled in squares are 1990. My black arrow for the higher income group shows you that rates of assisted living residents actually began to rise as early as 1990 for that population. But when we look at the lower income group, the squares stay together. We don't see a rise occur really until the 2000s, which is somewhat interesting given some of the Medicaid policy that was occurring um, beginning really around 2000 in terms of supporting community-based residents. Slide please. Now, when we go to say what proportion of these declines in nursing home residents that I've shown you are attributable to observable factors, um, so changes just simply in the shares of the population who are in minority race or ethnicity groups relative to changes in other covariates over time. What I did was a nonlinear regression decomposition, and I'm just summarizing at a high level for you the basic findings. The bars that go to the left represent covariates that help to explain the decline. Bars that go to the right actually indicate that changes in these covariates over time would have led to higher rates of nursing home residents. The two that I've shaded are for race and ethnicity. And as I hypothesized, it appears that a more diverse population is explaining about 25% of the observed decline from 1980 up through 2018 in nursing home residents. Some of the other factors that appear important are, important are somewhat surprising. Some of the state level economic uh, conditions appear to be quite important. And in this final phase of the project, I'm doing some state by state analysis to better understand what's happening. Slide please. So in conclusion, what are the implications for the SSI program? Well, as I've shown you, more financially vulnerable older adults appear to be living in community settings and they're doing so in more complex households. So not only did I find higher rates of co-residents with younger adult relatives, but I also found higher rates of co-residents with unrelated individuals. So this means there's potential for greater reliance on SSI support to cover those living expenses, and the determinations may become more complex when we're thinking about what payments people qualify for. There's one final thing I'd like to show you, slide please because I'd be remiss in not mentioning these patterns in the data that have been documented in research, uh, research as well. Here I'm showing you again, rates of assisted living residents, and this is the change from 1980 to 2018. There's a huge disparity here. In fact, all of the increase that I showed you earlier in assisted living appears to be coming from the behavior of white people. There's almost no change in our black population. I believe this is of particular concern considering that we believe these settings may deliver high, higher quality care. Slide please. So with that, thank you very much for your attention and I turn things over to Damon Jones.
Great, thanks. Um, so this is a uh, joint work with Alex Gelber, um, E. Lurie, and Daniel Sachs. Um, and so I'll start by motivating our study by uh, pointing out, which has already been uh, mentioned, that uh, life expectancy has risen um, uh, more quickly than the average retirement age during the last few decades. Uh, in that context, we wanna think about whether people's uh, working lives are gonna be enough to support retirement during longer uh, lives uh, in retirement. Um, and it's important to consider policies that might have an effect on whether workers decide to work more or less or retire earlier or later. And one policy of interest is the Social Security um, Annual Earnings Test. Next up, slide, please. So uh, let me just explain uh, some of the basics of the annual earnings test. Um, for people who are claiming and working at the same time, the earnings test uh, is gonna reduce your current benefits in the current year. And that's gonna be based on whether or not you earn above an exempt amount. So in 2020, for example, uh, for every $2 earned above this uh, threshold of $18,240, there's a $1 reduction in your current benefit. Um, that's going to be accompanied by an adjustment to your future benefit. So you will have a reduction now and an increase in the future. Um, and it's done in an actuarially fair manner um, to sort of preserve your uh, retirement wealth over your lifetime. Um, so <clears throat> I'm going to refer to this as a kink in your incentives, meaning that um, everything you've done prior to $18,240 doesn't affect your benefits. And it's only the marginal things that you do, the dollars you earn above $18,000, $18,240, that affects your benefit. Um, I'll come back to that because that's important to understand. Um, this applies to workers that are younger than a normal retirement age in 2019. That was um, more than half a million workers. Um, and actually, this is a policy relevant issue there, for example, with a recent um, legislation that was proposed uh, with the idea of eliminating the earnings test uh, because of how it affects people's decision to work. Um, so this is also something that's of uh, high interest and currently debated in policy discourse. Uh, next slide, please. So um, prior research has found that the earnings test can affect people's decisions when working. So in terms of how much you earn while you're still working, there is evidence that there's moderate um, response to the earnings test um, in the form of maybe reducing how much you earn to avoid uh, triggering the earnings test. Um, there's a set of early studies that do not have, that did not affect effects on whether or not you work at all. Um, but more recent studies that have been done by my co-authors and myself um, have shown that uh, there is an effect also on whether or not you work. Um, so this is uh, this earnings test isn't having an impact on people's uh, employment and earnings decisions. Uh, but a natural question that arises is why do we see such an effect? Um, as I mentioned, there's an actuarial adjustment. Um, and so you, if you lose benefits now, you are able to recoup them in the future um, once you reach the normal retirement age. And that might imply that there should only be a moderate response if at all, especially if you um, have some savings and you're not credit constrained. Um, your overall uh, wealth position is our wealth position is not being altered. Uh, so there's a question of why do people respond to the earnings test um, in, in the ways that we do see. Uh, next slide. Uh, one explanation is that maybe people don't fully understand the earnings test and in particular, that they don't understand that there's an actuarial adjustment. Um, and there's some survey evidence that might support this. And so if I don't know that my benefits are gonna be increased in the future, I may respond to the earnings test as if it's a permanent uh, loss and benefits. And that might explain some of the behavior, but what we're gonna focus on, uh, what we're focusing on in a current study is that the behavior that we see is even more pronounced than you would expect, even if people ignored the actuarial adjustment. And what I mean by that is that if you look at the uh, annual earnings test and where the threshold is, um, people seem to be uh, very concerned with earning below their earnings uh, test threshold, so just below. Um, uh, we're gonna call a, uh, an excess of people who are earning at the earnings test uh, bunching. And then I'm gonna refer to the pattern I just mentioned as less bunching, meaning that there's a disproportionate amount of people that uh, locate just below their earnings threshold. 
Um, and that's not necessarily what you would expect given the economic incentives. Um, and I'll explain why in a second, but first let me just document the empirical fact that people are left bunching. So we show this using administrative IRS data. We have an extract of people born between um, 1943 and 1951, and we have data on them from 1999 to 2018. Um, so what I'm gonna do is just show you a series of earnings plots. I'm gonna plot people, the, uh, the number of people who have earnings in bins relative to where their earnings test threshold is in that year. So um, I'm going to normalize things. So zero on a graph is going to represent where the earnings threshold is. And then you can see how people are earning relative to that threshold. Uh, next slide, please. So the first figure shows uh, what happens um, at age 60. Now at age 60, the earnings test is not um, affecting people. And so uh, if you look at this earnings distribution, you don't see anything in particular about age, uh, about the, the vertical line at zero. So that's where the threshold would be, um, but it's not actually in effect. And you see that there's a somewhat flat earnings distribution uh, for people. So this is at age 60. Um, and also I've plotted in gray age 61. So you can see that things don't change much between age 60 and 61. Uh, and then uh, one more thing I want to point out is the black line here is uh, basically we fit a polynomial or fit a regression to these dots, um, and, and that kind of smooth, smooths things out. And so uh, now what I want to do is go up to age 62. Next slide, please. And what you can see at age 62, if you look at the blue dots on the left, you can see that they are um, – getting much higher as you get close to zero and that's what we refer to as bunching this is also true on the right side but much less so and so what the evidence points to is that people are responding to this earnings test threshold in particular by not trying to go over it but they are putting in particular or they are putting in um, an additional amount of effort to be on the left side so they are not just randomly finding themselves above or below but particularly locating on the left side um, next slide. You can also see this at age 63, it's even more pronounced. The key thing to focus on are these blue dots to the left side, that they are much higher than um, the, they are much higher than what you would expect giving data far away from that, um, from that threshold. Uh, and so uh, if we go into the next slide, we also see this pattern at age 64. Um, so it becomes even more pronounced. And the, what we see in the data is that people are trying to be below the earnings test, um, and it seems like there's effort being put forth to do so. Um, next slide. So this is puzzling, and the reason why is that um, there's an actuarial adjustment, so maybe people shouldn't respond to this incentive much at all. But in addition, uh, if you were to uh, actually look at the way that this is implemented, um, as I said, if you earn above the earnings, uh, earnings test threshold, you lose current benefits, but there's adjust an adjustment to your future benefits. And in, a, in, a, and in fact, the adjustment is very discreet. So if you earn $1 above the earnings test threshold, you get an adjustment to your future benefits of about five ninths of 1% for all future benefits beyond a normal retirement age. It turns out that it's a really good deal to just be on the right side of the earnings test because you get a discrete adjustment and you have a very small reduction in your actual current benefit. Um, and so if anything, you should expect people to try to locate to the right. Um, in our paper, we discuss a number of explanations. I'm just gonna focus on one, which is that it's possible that people uh, misperceive this kink in, 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 uh, as a notch. And what I mean by a notch is that it seems like people may be interpreting this as a discrete loss in benefits. Um, so once you go above the exempt amount, if you think that you're gonna lose a significant amount of benefits for being any amount above the exempt amount, you might be particularly concerned about uh, locating to the left of this exempt, exempt amount. That's not exactly how the policy works, but that may be how people understand it to work. And so we think that there may be misperceptions, at least for a subset of the, the, the population. Next slide, please. So um, there may be some workers who misunderstand the, pol the policy in this way. There are two policy implications here. One is that you may wanna have information intervention to aid in decision-making. 
Another is that the way we collect, um, we implement the reduction in benefits may be affecting people's perception. And so that may um, also be something for future work to study and understand. Now I'm gonna uh, pass it back to Karen and she's gonna um, answer, allow people to ask questions, Q and A. Great, thank you very much, Damon. All three presentations were really great. Um, so well, I'm not gonna give you a break. I'm gonna start with a question for you, Damon. Um, and this may be outside the scope of your paper, but in practical terms, are there specific things you think the Social Security Administration could be doing to enhance understanding of the earnings test? Obviously, there's a lot of confusion out there. People aren't doing rational things. Are there specific things SSA can do? Well, as I mentioned on the last slide, there's two things that you could look at. You could imagine trying to give people um, more information about how the earnings test works. And sometimes information isn't enough to change behavior, but we have seen um, success, or not, I wouldn't say success, but we have seen effects of giving people information about social security and that affecting their actual decision to claim or not. And so making things more clear um, may help with that. And then you can, may look at behavioral economics to get a sense of what type of messaging and framing simplifies things as much as possible. The second thing is that the way that the earnings test is collected is not like a payroll payroll tax for many reasons. And so um, there's a delay between when you trigger the earnings test and when your benefits are going to be adjusted. And the way they're adjusted is in a very discreet fashion. It basically happens uh, in the form of basically a lapse in paychecks until you pay back the earnings test. So uh, in 2020, if you exceeded the earnings test starting in June, uh, in January of 2021, the way it's collected is that you don't get a check, I think, in January and February until you've paid back what was supposed to be reduced due to the earnings test. And that might cause people to believe that this is a this triggers a, a, a big loss in earnings, um, even if they went only a, a little bit over the earnings test. And that might be driving this sort of uh, less bunching pattern that we see, as well as maybe the other patterns that we've seen in other studies in terms of decisions to work or not. So that would be a much more um, costly or dramatic change in policy to try to figure out a more continuous way to adjust benefits um, that, that doesn't send the signal that is sent maybe by the, the, the stopping of paychecks. Great, thanks, Damon. Um, a question for Demir, this is from Melinda Morrill. How is the relationship between labor force participation and life expectancy moderated by education? Demir, I think you're on mute. Thank you. Uh, uh, we uh, didn't really uh, notice much um, uh, much influence there. Uh, we had uh, education uh, in our regressions, um, and of course, it, it did have a, it does have effect on, on labor participation. But um, I, we also had um, uh, the income, uh, and I think that it's it's difficult maybe so so it's difficult to really disentangle the the two effects, but. Uh, we uh, we did allow the um, effect of longevity to vary by by uh, income, and so that that showed that there is a significant um, uh, variation there. But um, um, I we didn't find much. Uh, I mean, maybe that's something to 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 look into more in more details to, to maybe uh, also uh, allow. This effect to, in, in the regression to, to vary by education. Great, thank you. Um, question for Mary. This is from Anna Rappaport. Do family structures affect the availability of family or extended family caregivers? Uh, do those okay? Do those structures affect nursing home use? What about the availability of Medicaid benefits for various types of care? 
Sure, thank you so much for the question. Um, so the short answer is yes, I do think that uh, family structure is important. And in the paper, what I try to do is use the detailed information about who lives in the home uh, with each of the older adults in the study. So that that way I can break down which relatives uh, might be providing informal care through co-residents. But one of the key limitations in census data, of course, is we don't know about the relatives or friends or other informal caregivers who live outside the home, who may be helping. And so they may be um, related by familial ties, but if they don't live within the same home, I do not observe that they are there providing care nearby and certainly don't observe anything in terms of uh, people who provide caregiving at a distance, which I'm sure many people who are listening today may have found themselves in that situation of having to care for someone at a distance. And it's um, may definitely influence the sort of then formal care that you purchase for that person in a setting where you cannot be nearby to supervise and assist. As far as Medicaid policies, this is one area where I did spend a lot of time in this current project and in my past research, looking at Medicaid support for home and community-based care. And those policies are actually in my regression decomposition model. And as I found in this paper and in prior papers, and I know others who have looked at those policies as well, find that it actually explains far less, and in some cases, none, of the patterns in institutional residents that we're seeing. So we know that spending definitely changes uh, in terms of the amount of money that states allocate to home and community-based services versus nursing home services when they have, say, a 1915C waiver in place or if they participated in the recent balancing incentives program. But when we try and tie that back to where are people actually living, that's a little bit tougher. And um, in, in general, when we think about this population, they're a fairly low mobility population in terms of they don't move frequently. And when they do, there's likely a lot of state dependence. So I think it is difficult to pick it up, but I was somewhat surprised in the work that I've done in this project, even looking over a very long time horizon, allowing for those policies to take a long time to take effect, that I'm not necessarily seeing um, the strong associations that I would expect. Great, thanks, Mary. Mm -hmm. um, one more question for Janira. Um, this is from Steve Goff. Um, between 1994 and 2019, we know that employment rates rose significantly at ages 60 and over, while they dropped at ages 25 to 54 for men, and they stayed about level for women. So if you conclude that rising life expectancy has little effect on this relative increase over 60 versus under 55, to what do you attribute this relative increase for older versus younger population? Um, yeah, that's a difficult one. Uh, and um, we didn't really, um, we didn't study other uh, effects, so it's it's a little too attributed to to uh, other things, um, and and it is it is entirely possible that that this is this was due to life expectancy. Uh, um, uh, over the last three decades, the life expectancy and labor force participation were growing uh, simultaneously, and so um, it's it's entirely possible that that that's that what we're seeing is that effect. But if we, you know, the, the thing is that this relationship is very sensitive um, to the time period that we choose. And so I think that looking at it um, like spatially, it brings, I think, another view and uh, maybe inform this, um, um, you know, inform our knowledge uh, a little bit more. Great, thanks. All right. Please in one more question for Mary. Um, Mary, there have been many studies in recent years showing that lower income individuals aren't really sharing in the life expectancy gain seen by the overall population. How do you square your results with those studies? That's a great question. Um, one of the things that I don't find uh, actually is much association between changes in the share of male 
uh, and the reduction in nursing home residents that I would have expected to see. And one of the mechanisms could be because the gains in life expectancy were uh, too small or in some cases non-existent for this population. So the punchline at the end for me, it was primarily increasing racial and ethnic diversity is associated with the decline in nursing home residents. There was a slight association, uh, though much smaller, between changes in marital status. Those are more dramatic in this population, but as the previous question indicated, that may be more due to changes in marital structure and less due to longevity. So I think the point is well taken, and I, I hope to explore that a bit further in the paper to provide um, some comparisons of longevity across the two populations that I shared today. Great. Thanks, Mary. And thank you all. Thank you to all the panelists for really interesting and policy relevant session. Um, we've now got a 25 minute break before the next panel starts at 10.30 a.m. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>